Good evening. Welcome to Faith Anglican Church's annual Monday Thursday celebration. Uh, it's also commemoration of our Lord's Last Supper and also washing of feet, uh, which Jesus showed himself to be the servant king and calls us to follow, no pen intended, in his footsteps. So let us worship together, singing Cornerstone. within the veil. Does anybody know what that means? The veil of the temple. Except Jesus is the veil between us and the Father in the heavenly throne room. And 
And so my anchor that is connected to me and to God is inside the heavenly holy of holies. It is through the veil. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, it's such great news. All right, let's stand for our, our, our hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Blessed be our God. Now and forever. Amen. This is the night that Christ, the Son of Man, gathered with his disciples in the upper room. This is the night that Christ, our Lord and Master, took a towel and washed his disciples' feet, calling us to love one another as he loved us. This is the night that Christ, our God, gave us this holy feast, that we who eat his bread and drink his cup may here proclaim his perfect sacrifice. This is the night that Christ, the Lamb of God, gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose dear Son, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life and who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings from Scripture. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until morning, you shall burn. In this manner, you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you, on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. The word of the Lord. Our psalm is Psalm 78. Would you please read with me in unison? He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. 
Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard, he was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob. His anger rose against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust his saving power. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. And he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens and by his power he let out the south wind. Stand. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. And before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him Jesus knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God rose from supper he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel tied it around his waist then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If, you do not, if, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this wonderful and solemn day. We thank you for not only Jesus dying for us and rising again, but for setting an example for us on how to serve one another. So Lord, we pray that you would blazon in our hearts your word this night. In Christ's name. Does anyone know what the earliest, you may see, uh, does anyone know what the uh, earliest creed of the church was? Three words. Jesus is, Lord. Jesus is Lord. That was the earliest creed. It came before the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. And, and um, it was the simplest saying. It's saying that he is Lord, he's Master, he's Sovereign. 
In modern American culture, we don't serve lords and ladies and kings and queens. In modern American culture, we tend to serve who? Ourselves. Ourselves. That's right. We don't serve no lords and no ladies and kings and queens. We serve ourselves. We tend to be our own lords and our own masters. Yet Jesus is the only Lord and Master of the universe, the only one capable of being the Lord of our lives. We certainly aren't capable. Yet the Lord Jesus, who is Lord of all, came as one like a servant. Isn't that amazing? He came one like a servant. From our reading in John 13, 1, Jesus said, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. One translation puts it like this, the NIV 1984. Did you know there's more than one NIV? Yeah, yeah they, 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 it's this, like a dynamic uh, translation, they keep changing it. But he said, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. I love that translation. He showed them the full extent of his love. Now, when I think of the full extent of Jesus' love, I usually think of the crucifixion. I mean, that's like the full extent of his love. He, he, he laid down his life for me. But that's not what he was talking about. In this context, he was talking about showing them the full extent of his love by tangibly washing their feet. That was how he showed them. Foot washing was a common practice in the first century. Uh, after a long day of walking in your sandals, or if you weren't that wealthy to walk, to walk barefoot, you've been walking in the muddy streets and the, the animal uh, droppings in the streets and people that have their uh, potty bucket or their slop bucket, throw it out the window, guess where they throw it? In the street. So everything that you can imagine that might come out of your body that's in the street and you're walking through that, okay, so when you get home, you really would want to wash your feet, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, you have blisters, you have cuts on your feet. It would be a really good idea to wash your feet. So normally, the lowest servant or slave of the household would wash the feet of the family. For whatever reason, Jesus and, and his apostles on the night of his Last Supper did not have their feet washed. So out of genuine love and concern for his apostles, during the Last Supper, he gets up and you know, puts a towel around his waist and, and starts washing their feet. His apostles were shocked. I mean, the Lord and Master of the universe doing the job of the lowest servant? I mean, the, the Lord and Master of the universe shouldn't stoop below his dignity. This is, he shouldn't be doing this, is the way, what they're thinking. So Peter said, Lord, you wash my feet. You shall never wash my feet. No, no, this, this, I can't imagine you doing this. And then, you know what? Jesus comes and tells him, no, I have to wash your feet. And if I don't, you'll have no part of me. So not only serving others, but being served is a requirement of Christians. So yes, we need to serve one another. We need to wash one another's feet, both symbolically and in, in reality. We also need to be willing to be served. And sometimes that's harder for some of us than it is to do the serving. Um, so Jesus revealed the full extent of his love, the Savior who serves, the sovereign who serves, the one who loves you from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. Jesus not only died for your salvation, but he comes into your life now, in this life, to love you in every detail of your life, even your feet. Isn't that wild? Yeah. That is just so contrary to the way of this world. You know, kings and czars and, and presidents and CEOs and, you know, all these kinds of people. Often we think of power and power plays and manipulation and stuff like that. But that's not what Jesus taught us. 
So what should your response be to a love so rich, so deep, and so practical, tangible? Verses 13 through 15, Jesus said, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then you, if then your teacher and Lord have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done for you. You know, there's different atonement theories. I think penal substitution is probably the most popular among evangelicals in America, or Christus Victor, which I think I'll talk about Sunday. Or did I talk about it on Palm Sunday? All these sermons are sort of getting mixed up in my head. Uh, but then there's also uh, the great exemplar. You know, Jesus gives us this example to follow. And all of those atonement theories, if you pull them all together, it really brings out the reality of what Jesus has done for us. But you, just like Jesus, serve us. He, he is, I've heard someone said that you've been saved to, to serve. That's right, you've heard me say it before. You've been saved to serve. You know, um, sometimes I think we mistakenly think that we've been saved to be served. We're going to be kings and queens, princes and princesses, you know, princes and princesses, lords. Uh, but when we do that, when we think that God has saved us just so that he can pour out his blessings upon us and that's it, then we tend to, what I've heard one preacher say is sit, soak, and sour. We just sort of sit back, serve me. I didn't like that song. I didn't like that message. It was a little too uncomfortable. I wish these seats were green instead of, you know, it's like, serve me. But that's not, we've been saved to serve, not to be served. To serve our fellow believers. To serve our family members. You know, sometimes serving family members is harder than serving friends. I know no one would want to say an amen out loud here, of course. But, uh, sometimes serving family members is, can be difficult. Sometimes it's parents. Sometimes it's children. Sometimes it's siblings. Sometimes it's just it's somebody. Or sometimes even people in the church can be difficult to want to serve. And, uh, but God has called us to do that and to serve one another and to serve those who don't know Jesus. You know, sometimes there are people that are absolute jerks. Have any of y'all met any of those? They're around. I've heard about them. You know, maybe I haven't personally met one, but, but they're around, and, and God has called us to serve them too. I mean, think about it. Jesus had Judas Iscariot on his inner team. He knew from the beginning he was going to betray him, and this guy's a jerk. He's going to kiss him on the cheek and betray him. And Jesus is serving him too. So God calls us to serve people that aren't believers, people that are jerks, to show the tangible love of Christ in ways that may, may hopefully turn their hearts around. So what does it look like today to wash someone's feet? And we have a foot washing ceremony that we do on Monday, Thursday, that is available for anyone that would like to. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, it, it's a way of, of tangibly reminding us of what God has called us to do. It's, you know, it's interesting, the two sacraments of the gospel are baptism and Holy Communion, and they both have tangible things. There's water. And then there's bread and wine. And foot washing, it's not a sacrament of the church, but it's, but it's sort of like one, isn't it? There's something tangible there, something you do, something you feel. And, and um, it's a way of reminding us in a very, um, well, tangible kind of way that, that God wants us to serve one another. Not just one another here, but when we get out the door. So it's, I think... Um, what sort of foot washing in modern society might look like, it's taking the less glorious tasks for yourself. Yeah, I'll do that. 
gosh, I hate doing that. You know? But, you know, just like, yeah, I'm willing to do that. You know? It's cleaning the cat box when it's not your turn. <laughs> you know? It's uh, unloading the dishwasher when it's not on your to-do list. By the way, Mary, I did that this afternoon. <laughs> just, just, I want to get a little points there. <clears throat> Um, it's picking up that paper towel in the restroom at the restaurant. You ever seen one on the floor? And think, golly, what slobs. I can't believe they haven't picked them up. Whoops. Maybe I'll just pick it up and be a servant today. You know, maybe, maybe they haven't been able to hire enough people here. Instead of grumbling and complaining, maybe I should be the servant and help them out a little bit. So I think that's sort of what being a servant looks like. You can think about it at home, you can think about it at, at, at work, you can think about it in public. Um, it may be helping that neighbor with that big project he or she wanted to do on Saturday. The Saturday you really wanted to go to the zoo or go running or whatever it is. You know, and, and they say, can you, can you help me with that? And you're like, yeah, <laughs> sure. You know, it, it's things like that. It, it's seeking to bless others and not yourself, not to exalt yourself, but to bless others. Satan wants you to serve others. Did you know that? Satan wants you to serve others so that others will think well of you and you'll get puffed up with pride and you'll think more highly of yourself. Man, I'm a great Christian. <laughs> but God wants you to serve others selflessly with no thought of reward. No publicly saying, hey, sweetheart, I unloaded the dishwasher. You know, not wanting that sort of, you know, just, just wanting to do it because you want to do it. Uh, there was a, a friend of mine who was working the 12-step program, and he'd been in and out of rehab. And, um, and I remember... He's been clean from crack cocaine for like six, seven years now. And I remember when he came back from a rehab facility in, in Nashville, and, and, he, and we were, I was giving him some spiritual direction, and I said, what I think you need to do is try to find ways to bless others with them never knowing you did it. And never uh, telling anyone else you did it. That you're doing it not so you can feel so great about yourself, but just to be a servant. And that was such a radical concept for him, and he did it. And um, that goes against our human nature, doesn't it? I mean, we want power, we want position, we want pension. That's the three Ps, right? Power, position, and pension. You know, we want those, those things where we feel important. And Jesus says, well, I'm important. I created the universe, but I'm going to come and wash the feet. I'm going to get all the doo-doo out between your toes. And that's what he wants us to do as well. Um, several years ago, Pastor Stephen Cole was out running uh, in the forest near his home, sort of doing some cross-country running kind of thing. And um, when he was running, he was thinking about the 19th century British preacher, Charles Spurgeon. And then he thought about Spurgeon's father. And have you all ever heard of John Spurgeon? Exactly. No one's ever heard of John Spurgeon. And, uh, but he was also a preacher. Uh, Charles' father. He wasn't well known. Both had served the Lord faithfully. And one became famous and one obscure. And the more... Um, Stephen Cole, Pastor Stephen Cole, thought about this as he was running along, you know, doing his running. He realized that what's really important is faithfulness, not fame. Faithfulness to the Lord, faithfulness to his family, faithfulness as a faithful pastor to the flock. And then Pastor Cole said this. He said, the Lord never says, well done, good and famous servant. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. And you notice it wasn't well done, good and faithful Lord, was it? Well done, good and faithful servant. He said, if God makes me as famous as Charles Spurgeon, that's his business. My business is to be as faithful as John Spurgeon.
version. Hmm. I tell you, as a pastor, that just puts chills down my spine. I mean, literally, I just felt it. Oof. Notice that Jesus says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. He doesn't say, well done, good and faithful master, or lord, or boss, or chief. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful foot washer. Well done, good and faithful one who selflessly serves others. For you have shown the full extent of your love and God's love to others. Servanthood is not being consumed with yourself. Servanthood is practical, tangible love for others. I read a story about a king who lived many, many years ago in ancient times. And he placed a boulder in the king's highway. Then he hid himself to watch and see if anyone would actually remove that stone. Some of the king's wealthiest merchants uh, came along and, and uh, they saw the stone and they noticed the stone and some of them griped about the stone, you know. Can't believe there's potholes in this road. I said that recently, by the way, <laughs> about Memphis. There's this huge spoon, and, and they're like griping and complaining about the king's highway. And, uh, and finally a peasant came along, and he had a load of vegetables on his back, and he laid them down. He was exhausted. He was trying to go to market to sell them. And, and he looked at the stone, and he, he, laid, he laid down, and he pushed and pushed, and finally he rolled the stone off the path. And he was about to pick up his vegetables and go on. The king is sitting there in the woods watching him and the, and the, and the peasant looks down and there scrunched into the mud below where the rock had been was a pouch, a purse filled with gold coins. And a little note from the king saying whoever moves this stone receives this reward. Your heavenly king has commanded you to wash feet, to serve others, to move boulders for the sake of others, and when you do, he will reward you. He will tell you, well done, good and faithful servant. So show your family, your co-workers, I know you three guys all work together, <laughs> your friends, your enemies the full extent of your love and God's love to one another. Serve them. Serve them expecting no reward. Amen. Now let's pray for ourselves. Like for each other here. Okay. Lord God, it is so contrary to our human nature to be, to be servants. So Lord, we pray that you would help us and you would give us very obvious opportunities to serve one another throughout these next few weeks. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, fellow servants of our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night before his death, Jesus set an example for his disciples by washing their feet an act of humble service. He taught that their strength and growth in the life of the kingdom of God come not only by worldly power and authority, but by such lowly service. Therefore, I invite you who share in the royal priesthood of Christ to come forward that you may recall whose servants we are by following the example of our master. Come now, remembering his admonition that what will be done for you is also to be done by you to others. Engrave on your hearts and mirror in your actions Jesus' words. A servant is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, 
Blessed are you if you do. The Lord Jesus, rising from supper, laid aside his outer garment, took a towel and washed his disciples' feet. Then he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Uh, tonight we have three foot washing stations, and um, this is a ceremonial thing, uh, but Jesus did it in a very real way. So if you would like to wash uh, someone's feet, you can ask them. They may not want to, and that's okay. They, for whatever reason, may be medical, it may be uh, personal, or whatever it is, you know, that's fine. You know, somebody doesn't, so, so anyone that would like to wash somebody else's feet, you can just ask them and come forward to one of these stations and, and enjoy doing that. Okay? And when we're done, we'll, um, we'll move on in the service.
Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop, and Frank, our assisting Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy. 
for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially for Joe, our president. For all those who departed this life in the certain hope of their resurrection, in thanksgiving let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, in our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the people and clergy of Church of the Redeemer, Chattanooga, Tennessee, asking you, Lord, to bless and strengthen their ministry and fellowship to be good witnesses for Jesus Christ. Please join me in the prayer for mission. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, for the honor of your name. Amen. Let's just take a moment to lift up to the Lord those that we know, who we think don't know him or have backslidden away from him. Let's just take a moment just to lift those people up uh, in prayer. In the silent labor loud. Well, we pray that you would bring uh, laborers into their harvest. If they be us or someone else, Lord, we just pray you'd send them. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us uh, confess our sins, humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Please kneel at table. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will. Walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And the reason we have an absolution after the confession is to, because sometimes people have very, like, uh, they, they're filled with blame and shame and just think maybe God can't forgive us. And the absolution is simply to say, yes, if you've confessed your sins to the Lord, you really are forgiven. So, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Jesus instituted the, uh, the Lord's Supper um, on that last night, that last supper that he had with them. And so we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper tonight. Um, I just want, there's a, should be in your bulletin, but the people say, what does Monday mean? And it means, um, uh, it comes from the Latin word mandatum, which translated means commandment. So Monday, Thursday is commandment Thursday. So what did Jesus command us to do? Love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. And so that's tangibly worked out in how we do things, you know, how we serve one another and, um, and those kind of things. So uh, tomorrow is Good Friday. Uh, it is one of two fast days in the Christian year. Uh, so... Does anyone remember what the, the first fast day in the Christian year is? Ash Wednesday. And that's the beginning of Lent. And then the last one is, the second one or the last one is, um, is Good Friday. So Lent begins and ends with a fast. And if you've not fasted before, uh, then uh, I encourage you to try it. Um, it may be giving up one meal or it may be giving up uh, all your meals for the day. And some people just drink water. Some people... Uh, that can't quite do that, might have a little juice in their water or something. But I encourage you to give up something and take that time that you would normally be eating and spend that time praying, okay? So you can just draw closer to the Lord. Uh, our, our Good Friday service will be here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Um, we'll have our, uh, our uh, Good Friday sermon about the crucifixion. And we'll have uh, the Good Friday liturgy. And then outside, we have a set of stations of the cross uh, out in the woods on a path back in there and so what we'll do is we'll bring flashlights or your phone with a flashlight on it you know and and I, I check the weather it's supposed to be good so we'll get to do the stations of the cross outside it's really really moving so I encourage you to, to come and, and bring some friends uh, Easter this Sunday we come and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus uh, we'll have a, a extravaganza thing after the service for the kids, you know, and um, and we'll also have our flowering of the cross. Uh, I, don't, if, I don't know if y'all have done that before, but you, you start with sort of some ugly sticks, and then you just cover them with flowers, and it's called the flowering of the cross, and it reminds us that, you know, the, the crucifixion of Jesus was so horrible and ugly, and and yet, here he is, risen from the grave. And so you have this cross just covered with flowers. So we have that this Sunday um, as well. Any other announcements? All right, well, if you're a baptized Christian, you're welcome to come to the Lord's table tonight.
Let's ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts. <laughs>
when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death he might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory. We might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our, our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, for we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.
this meeting in prayer to prepare us to go forth. And then uh, on Monday, Thursday, we have a, a special ceremony called the Stripping of the Altar. And what we're doing is basically um, we're taking all the fancy stuff out of the building so that on Good Friday, it will be very somber. As it should be. It's a, it's a, it's a good day. So uh, we'll have a special um, cello, piano, uh, piece of music um, that we play during that time. Daryl is going to be doing that. I'd like to be done a little bit. And whoever would like to help with the um, stripping of the altar, taking all of these pretty things out, uh, feel free just to come on up and we'll show you what to do. Or you can just sit and you can pray or sit and pray. And if you'd like to stay afterwards, uh, you can stay for a while and just pray. Uh, but we'd like everybody to leave in silence after the altar of the prescription. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank, thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And for sharing us in these holy mysteries, that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Thank you. 